Hi, my topic is carnivorous plants. So in class we discussed the importance of assimilation and we also discussed the importance of um, anions like um, dihydrogen phosphate or nitrate. And we also mentioned that these anions are kind of tricky for the plant to acquire because they are easily rinsed out of the soil. Well, now I'm going to tell you what happens to the plants that, over a course of millions of years, become used to never having enough of those anions. Carnivorous plants are defined as plants that supplement their nutrient requirements by trapping, killing, and digesting small animals, usually insects. <sighs> And with that, I welcome you to my info dump slide. The slide where I tell you everything I think you should know about carnivorous plants before I can take you on a tour of their biodiversity. Now, I mentioned that they usually prey on insects. This is why we can also call carnivorous plants insectivorous plants. Besides insects, other small animals such as arachnids, mollusks, earthworms, small rodents, reptiles, amphibians can also be entrapped in their traps which are made of modified leaves and stems. The habitat where carnivorous plants grow in are wet, they're open, and they're sunny. The soil there lacks um, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and the pH of the soil is acidic. Pla places that um, fit this description are acidic bogs, or exceptionally wet meadows, or moist s sand. The aquatic variety lives in ditches, or ponds, that are also acidic. Now. You might be thinking, well, if the nutrients they lack are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, wouldn't NPK fertilizer be helpful to them? No, you are wrong. Because these plants are so used to never having enough of these minerals, all of a sudden having these minerals would, for most of them, probably mean death. Which is interesting because, from what I have found, carnivorous plants tend to be, well, masochists. You can trample them and they will like it. They will thrive by doing that. You will germinate their seed. If you were to burn down the entire habitat they live in, they'd be back before any other plant. But, if you raise the concentration of minerals in their soil, they die. I'm not even talking about um, incredibly high concentrations here. I mean, the concentration typically um, appropriate for a household plant, for instance. Lower concentrations of fertilizer can work. Now, keep in mind, Carnivorous plants are still photosynthetic, and that means that they are autotrophs. The reason why this can be slightly confusing is because they catch their prey. That doesn't mean they're not autotrophs. That just means that they have, through evolution, found alternative ways to get the nutrients they can't get from the soil. Now, these plants are not actually that closely related. They, in fact, evolved independently about nine times in five different orders of flowering plants. I told you already why, because the minerals in the ground were not enough. But I didn't tell you how. German scientists actually sequenced the entire genomes of both carnivorous and non-carnivorous plants. And what they found was that the carnivorous and non-carnivorous, such as um, papaya and beetroot, had a shared ancestor 60 million years ago. 
that managed to duplicate their genome and then repurposed this copy, the genes on this copy, so that, for instance, the gene that would help in absorbing the nutrients from the ground now helped absorb the nutrients from the prey, which is insects. And I think that that is really cool. And the reason why I think that is really cool is because that means that pretty much any plant could become carnivorous in the right environment with, you know, a few million years to spare. But still. <sighs> I also need to mention that these traps remember I said the traps are modified leaves and stems these traps on any type of carnivorous plant are covered with microscopic glands and these glands perform a variety of roles for instance sometimes they might be receptors that sense the presence of the prey other times they can secrete digestive fluids which can dissolve pretty much an entire arthropod except for their shell made out of heating or they can help they can absorb the products of this digestion afterwards there are about 750 species of carnivorous plants and about 20 genera emphasis on the about part because the data on this is by no means conclusive However, I do know that in Croatia, there are eight species in four genera. And I will talk about every genus here. There's four total, and I'll mention all of them. Now we come to the types. We have active, semi-active, aka adhesive, and passive traps. All right. so. As per usual, active translates to uz utroshak energie, passive means without, and semi-active are weird because they're kind of in the middle. They're semi-active. So that means that from what I can tell you now, which it'll be much easier an example later, but basically Think of it as if they passively catch the prey, but actively digest the prey. Now let's start on the active traps. Active traps have trigger hairs. And when these trigger hairs are stimulated, it releases a action potential, what makes the trap close abruptly. So let's start with the most famous carnivorous plant and probably the most commercially sold carnivorous plant, the Dionea muscipula, aka the Venus flytrap. As I've already said, they have trigger hairs that release action potential. However, I would like to note that one action potential is not enough to close a Venus flytrap. In fact, it has to have two action potentials released from the trigger hairs within a certain time frame. Now, here are pictures. Um, this one here is a bit different. It is a cultivar, actually. The Dionea muscipula is the only um, species in the Dionea genus. But of course, we have cultivars as with everything else. And this particular cultivar is called the Dionea muscipula sawtooth. Digestion takes three to five days, and as I've said already, the entire arthropod is dissolved except for the heating outer shell, as you can see in this before and after picture. Venus flytraps can also go several months with between meals. I'm going to show you some videos. So here's a gif of a frog being caught. The frog can probably get out of this because its muscles, its leg muscles are probably strong enough to free itself. But I 
put this here to illustrate that not only insects can be caught in these traps. So, here's a fly, for instance. There it goes. Here's a bee, and as you can see here, it's in the trap, but two action potentials haven't been released yet, because two trigger hairs haven't been stimulated yet. And there it goes. And finally, I have an ant. You get the picture. Now, another thing I would like to note is that it's important for the prey to wiggle until the carnivorous plant closes completely. Because otherwise, if it doesn't, for instance, if you put a piece of hamburger meat, it's going to open up again because it doesn't, it's not being constantly stimulated from the inside. Probably the reason why this happens is because over time, I mean, it's a lot of energy for the plant to digest anything. If a piece of rain falls into it, for instance, it shouldn't digest that, and therefore it'll reopen without digesting anything. Aldrovanda vesiculosa water wheel. This one is found in Croatia and it's called Vodina stupica. It lives in water and it has 40 trigger hairs lining its inner surface. The reason why in English we call it a water wheel is because it looks like a water wheel. Now this one's kind of similar to a Venus flytrap in the sense that it also snaps shut. Um, I will show you a video of it catching mosquito larvae now. So it won't actually catch this one, even though the camera is focusing on it pretty heavily. But you will see how it snaps. It did catch that one, though. You see its head of the larva is entrapped. And it's struggling, but it won't escape. Moving on. Now, a slightly different type of active trap, the Utricularia genus. This one has multiple species within a genus. The other two that I mentioned had only one. In English, they're called bladderworts. In Croatian, because they're also found in Croatia, they're called mieshinke. Now, bladder and miech are in the names because Utricularia plants have these inflated pouches with trap doors, as you can see in this, these pictures. So these little bubbles are the inflated pouches. Here is an extreme close-up. This was already close-up. Here's an extreme close-up. The way these work is when the trap is at rest, the hinge is closed. They have a hinge that you cannot quite see, but it closes it off. And whatever liquid is within the trap will be absorbed, making the water pressure lower. And if anything, an insect for instance, um, these are in water, obviously, were to rub itself, brush itself against one of these trigger hairs, these can also feed on mosquito larvae, um, then whatever brushed itself against the trigger hair would be sucked inside of the trap because the lid would open up, causing the difference in pressure to <laughs> the prey inside. And here are some pretty pictures of the Utricularia in blossom. Now I'm going to show you how this looks. Again, extreme close-up. Yep, there it is. The latter portion of the video, I think, will show this better from a different angle. This part here. Yeah. Moving on. Adhesive traps. So these are the semi-active traps I mentioned before, and I said that they are 
best explained on particular examples. And I stand by that. So, let's start with the Drosera genus. This genus has 194 species in it, which is a lot. Now, in English, they're called sundews. In Croatian, they're called rosike. The reason for both those names, du, rosa, it's because they have these modified leaves that are covered with these stalked glands, as you can see here, that have these, you see these little droplets on the tip? They're um, actually sticky mucilage, but it looks like dew, a dew drop. And the way they catch their prey is the prey lands on top of them. That is the passive part. And the active part is when they fold themselves over the prey so that they can digest it. And as I said, they have a lot of species. Here's a different one. Now I have a few videos. This is my favorite video. Now, um, as you can see, some of these stalks on the outer part are longer. These are for entrapping the prey. These on the inner part um, mostly secrete digestive fluids, I mean enzymes, and they can also help entrap the prey. I also read somewhere that there is a hormone called auxin, which is a growth hormone that the plant releases that causes them to fold over like that. So the stalks are actually growing when they fold like that. And here is a, another species. At first it might not look too different besides maybe the size of the um, stalks, but if we, when it churns over here, you can see that the back side does not have any of these glands, whereas here both sides are covered in these stalks. <sighs> Moving on. The Pinguicula genus, in English known as butterwort, in Croatian known as Tustice. So, the naming here is pretty consistent because pinguis is the Latin adjective for fat and butter is also fat and tust means fat too. So, <laughs> why? <laughs> well, it's because, all right, so they form these little rosettes of stalkless leaves that are covered, absolutely covered in goop. And so this goop is this greasy, sticky mucus and the way that they catch their prey, the prey lands on top of them, and they function in a similar way to flypaper because the insect can't get off. And then through the surface of the leaf, the insect is absorbed. Some of these, I think, can also fold over themselves in a similar way like the drosera. And here is a video of an insect struggling to be free, but it's clearly not helping because it's getting more and more stuck. And here is a frankly unnecessarily creepy video from a documentary in the early 60s that you can see an ant dying on a butterwort. Yeah. Um, finally, I have passive traps. None of these are present in Croatia, at least not to my knowledge. And the reason why they're passive traps is because they entice the prey with scents, colors, and nectar, and the prey comes to them, which also I will explain on examples. Now, the reason why I'm grouping all of these together, even though they're very diverse and are several families of plants, they all pretty much function on a similar principle. Pitfall plants or pitcher plants, this is how they look. 
They are characterized by this internal chamber. And they have evolved independently at least six times. So they're not really related, but they do look very similar. Now, the way they catch their prey is they have these various fringing lips that um, put off the scents and are covered in nectar, which entices the prey to come on top of them. And then they have this part here that is covered in these downward pointing hairs. So the insect can walk on top of that without a problem. But everything below that, this part, is a zone that is very waxy, it is very sticky, and the insect can't possibly grasp onto it with its little insect feet. And so what ends up happening is they fall downwards into this. This liquid is rainwater plus digestive enzymes plus other insects in various stages of decay and digestion. And also, to make it even better, they have um, these species of insects that are um, resistant to the digestive enzymes. So, for instance, um, certain types of mites, but also fly larvae. And so these fly larvae then attack the newest victims. They kill them and they eat them. And then their excrement is what the plant will um, digest and get its nutrients from. So they have this symbiotic relationship between these plants. If these um, um, symbiotic insects weren't there, the victim would just drown and then be dissolved. Um, you might notice here in this picture, there is a woolly bat inside of this pitcher plant. Why? Well, this one looks dead, but the reason why it would be there is because woolly bats, for some reason, really like roosting in pitfall plants. So much so that even if they had options of, well, to us, seemingly better habitats, they would still prefer living in a pitcher plant. And so this works out great for the plant itself because much like with the um, symbiotic insects, it feeds off of the excrement of the woolly bat. Now, these here are a little bit different. I believe they are called Darlingtonia californica, aka cobra lilies. And so, as you can see, they're pretty, they look dry. They have these hoods that go over completely, so there is no rainwater in them, and they don't really have much digestive fluids either. For a time, um, scientists thought they didn't have any. The way they function is that they also entice the prey to come up in this part and enter inside of them. And if you can see closely, there are these more translucent parts on the surface. Those are actually called false exits. And so the insect seeing the sun will try to crawl towards it and will actually end up getting deeper and deeper inside of the internal chamber of the cobra lily, and then it will die of exhaustion. I have one more video of this wasp. It is presumably licking nectar off of this pitfall plant. Um, the scents of the pitfall plants can also be very disorienting to the insect, and you can see it looks pretty drugged. That nectar must be good. And so, there it goes.
my final video is the the insides of one of these pitfall plants as you can see there are various insects that are not very much um, digested some more so than others these are my sources i yield my time thank you for listening goodbye